Hey guys, Carlson here. One last time for Unit 4 to finish up our Chapter 7 video lecture notes. It's going to cover 7, 8 through 7, 13, uh, but 10 and 11 are going to be real quick because we're going to touch on the details in class. So 7, 8, we're going to cover the difference between cardiac and smooth muscle and how it compares with the skeletal. Remember that the cardiac muscle is only found in the heart, while the smooth muscle is found within almost every organ. It could form a sheet, a bundle, or sheaths around other tissues to help performance functions. We're going to look at the structure of the two first to just see what uh, they look like in comparison to skeletal muscle tissues. Cardiac does have single centrally placed nuclei. Uh, the myofibril arrangement is similar to that of skeletal muscle which gives that striated appearance. And one of the big uh, most notable differences between both types of other muscle tissues is that the cardiac has connection with other cells at an intercalated disc. Here is a picture of some cardiac muscle tissue and this black line is outlining a single branching cardiac cell. You can see the centrally located nuclei and in between each spot or each cell there you, see, you can see the kind of like a dark line um, showing that intercalated disc. And what that disc actually does is perform, or provide a rapid passage for ions and molecules that need to go back and forth from the heart itself. Now the smooth is similar in size. They also have single centrally placed nuclei. They're spindle shaped. Now they don't have a striated appearance because of their uh, filament locations and there are no myofibrils or sarcomeres. And uh, during contraction, these, uh, this muscle tissue actually twists like a corkscrew due to that filament location not being set and structured like the other two types. And uh, here's a picture. You can see some cell nuclei being pointed out. Um, it it kind of looks smoother and kind of wavy. Here uh, you have a little uh, breach in it or almost like a little river going through it for a blood vessel. Alright, now uh, comparing their functions, the cardiac is going to contract without neural stimulation. So remember this is involuntary and that's controlled by what we call pacemaker cells. They just make sure that the rate at which the muscle there is being stimulated is good for the organ, uh, the heart. Uh, the contractions will last about 10 times longer than that of the skeletal muscle fibers and because of the membrane structure uh, this particular area cannot undergo tetanus or a sustained muscle contraction which is good right because we don't really want um, that to happen in your heart otherwise blood wouldn't pump regularly. Um, the action potential that happens here is going to increase the permeability of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and uh, this area also relies on aerobic metabolism for energy to contract. Now the smooth, uh, the calcium ions that trigger their contractions, they do that differently. You get that, they get that from an extracellular source and they contract over greater distances due to the filaments lacking that rigid organization. This is important for the organs that they line such as the bladder and the stomach that need to change due to volume intake and to kind of stretch out. Um, many of the smooth muscle tissues are not innervated or have motor neurons. They're also controlled by pacesetter cells or uh, some kind of environmental or hormonal stimula stimulation. And again, these are never under voluntary control either. And uh, some special areas that have rings of smooth muscles are called uh, sphincters, allowing for things to come in and go out. Now, 7-9 uh, goes over some descriptive terms that are used to name skeletal muscles. I'm going to just give you some brief definitions and examples, and this is part of what we're going to be practicing in class. Uh, but the origins are where a muscle begins, and the insertions are where a muscle ends, and together they produce a single action. Now, um, the origin generally remains stationary while the insertion will move. And we determine the origin and insertion based on movement from the anatomical position. And that's kind of the big thing you need to remember when we're trying to identify origins and insertions. And then also relate that to a particular action or movement. Um, here's a picture of your bicep. And you can see that the origin is here, again, starting from the anatomical position from the top. It's connected to the scapula. And then the insertion is there at the radius. And it's also showing your tricep here in the picture. And we're going to talk about a couple more uh, action descriptions. And there are actually two ways you can do this. The muscle action in terms of the bone affected. So you could say the biceps brachii performs flexion of the forearm. Or you can say the muscle action in terms of the joint involved. And that would be the biceps brachii performs flexion of the elbow. Now, um, the second option is more popular today, especially for 
kinesiologists, uh, physical therapists that work with movement or anybody who works with movement. And so we will also focus on using this second method, uh, describing the muscle action in terms of the joint involved. Now, we can describe uh, muscles by their primary actions when we're trying to do this. And so we have a prime mover or the agonist, which is a muscle that is mostly responsible for the movement. And then we have the antagonist that are the muscles whose actions oppose the movement uh, produced by the other muscle. Now, agonist and antagonist are functionally opposite. So usually if one is the agonist, the other is the antagonist, and then the role reverses for the opposite movement. All right, we also have synergists and fixators. And a fixator you're gonna find is a type of synergist, but a synergist is just a smaller muscle that helps the prime mover. Uh, it can help pull near the insertion, or if it's a fixator, it's actually going to um, stabilize the origin of the prime mover by preventing movement at another joint. And so uh, here we have all the muscle actions if we are looking at an elbow flexion. The prime mover of the agonist would be the biceps brachii. Your synergist would be the brachialis, a smaller muscle there underneath. And then the antagonist is the triceps brachii. And the fixator would be a muscle that holds the scapula firmly in place, such as this rhomboideus. And they don't have it labeled, um, but it would be um, about right in this area here. All right, um, review table 7.3 for muscle terminology. And we're, again, we're gonna practice with this in class, but just take a look at it so maybe some of the terms will sound more familiar to you when you work with them. And as we work with them in class, they will become more familiar to you. All right, 7, 10, and 11 review the axial and appendicular muscle groups. So uh, read each section, color code in your uh, hat pack to familiarize with them, and review the tables, and we'll, we'll practice with these in class as well. 7, 12 just talks about how when we advance in age, the size and power of the muscle tissue decrease. Um, so some things that happen as we age is that the muscle fibers become smaller, uh, the, they become less elastic, uh, exercise tolerance decreases, and the ability to recover from injuries also. And uh, some reasons for this aging include a decrease in myofibrils, it causes that size reduction, which also reduces blood flow. Um, fibrosis starts to occur, which is an increased amount of fibrous connective tissue. This uh, reduces flexibility. Uh, you may quickly tire because you have a reduced ability to thermoregulate or release heat. So that makes the exercise seem less tolerable. And then your body also has limited repair capabilities at this point. So um, the muscle performance, though, the decline rate is actually the same for everybody. So to be in good shape late in life, you actually need to be in good shape earlier in life, which gives you a great reason to exercise regularly. So this doesn't have to be extreme exercise, just uh, general um, regular exercise. I think they recommend like an hour a day uh, to improve your quality of life. Uh, finally, 713 is exercises produce responses in multiple body systems. So basically, active muscles consume oxygen and generate carbon dioxide and heat, and it will affect your other systems in the following ways. Um, your cardiovascular, respiratory, integumentary, and nervous and endocrine systems all play a part when you're active. So go ahead and look these four over. I'm going to go ahead and finish up now, and you can pause this as you need to. Uh, my last slide just points out that the systems integrator also talks about how one system affects the other, and for this particular chapter, it's on page 241. All right, guys, I'll see you later.